I'm Kevin Davis, and this is the Catholic Family Podcast. Thank you very much for joining me. And you recognize this face over here next to me, this lovely lady who has been on the Catholic Family Podcast a couple of times now with her videos, creating things, Catholic crafts and, and um, crowns for Our Lady. Very nice videos that I know that the mothers and probably fathers also have appreciated. And hope, hopefully she will continue doing such videos on the channel because I think they're they're very, very nice and a nice mix up from politics and all that other garbage that we do here on the Catholic Family Podcast. So we appreciate Holly again joining us. And today's going to be a little bit different, though. We're not going to talk about crafts. We're not talking about politics. And we're not talking about a conversion story, which we've had before. We've talked about many conversions, conversions from Protestantism, conversions from the Novus Ordo. Holly's a little bit different. Holly was practically born, but definitely raised as a traditional Catholic. And unfortunately, she fell away. Fortunately, she came back. So she is a story of reconversion, I suppose you could say. And I think that's one that is very near and dear to many of our hearts. I know many people have had it themselves or know someone who has fallen away. And maybe this will help give them a little bit of that hope. And especially shortly after the Feast of St. Monica in, in having that hope that, that a, a lost sheep can return to the flock. And so, Holly, thank you so much for, for joining us. And maybe start from the beginning. Maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and where you're from and, and um, where you are. All right. Well, thanks so much for having me, Kevin. Uh, happy to be back. Um, so I am in Canada and you've probably heard me say this in my other videos. I'm from Our Lady of Victory in London, Ontario. And this is the parish that I've been at my whole life, minus the span that I was gone. Um, but I did want to just say something I did when you're a little child, and this is just me growing up. I realized that when you're a kid and you're Catholic, you always think that you're going to be a Catholic, like I don't know if any other Catholics feel this way when they were kids, but I always felt like, you know, I'm going to get married. I'm going to marry a nice Catholic and I'm going to always be a Catholic. And I'm always going to love God. And you have these feelings. And then uh, that didn't happen for me. So um, it's just to me, it's just so um, surreal almost to be here because I never thought that this is the way my life was going to go. So um, as you mentioned, Kevin, I, my grandfather found Our Lady of Victory when I was about five years old. And um, all the way um, going up, up until high school, um, I'm going to say I had the very typical, very normal Catholic upbringing. I will say, though, that um, my father wasn't Catholic. So um, we were primarily raised Catholic by my mother. And my father was of no faith. Um, and he never went to church. But... Um, we were homeschooled. I was homeschooled from grade six until grade eight. And in grade eight, we were actually taught by our parish priest at the time, which was Father Anaya. And we spent every day at, at the church um, doing school. And it was very, everything was very Catholic centered. Everything was incredible. It was actually, when I look back at my childhood, the best year of my life. It was honestly the best year of my life. And, um, then when I went to high school, I went to a secular high school in my hometown. It was a small high school, but still secular nonetheless. Um, that's when everything kind of just fell apart uh, for me. And um, what happened was I went from just being around Catholics all the time. Um, my whole life, everything was Catholic centered. My friends, I just had some small friends um, at the Catholic church. And then I went to high school and all of a sudden you're swept up into this whole secular world that you have been completely absent from for, you know, a good chunk of your life. And you are completely swayed. Um, well, I shouldn't say completely swayed. I was swayed. Um, I didn't have the personality I felt um, that could take all that secular pressure um, so, and I wasn't a leader, I was a follower. So I just wanted to blend in. I didn't want to stand out. I didn't want to be different. I didn't want to be, um, you know, the weird homeschool kid that came to high school because you have to understand too. The thing is, is I went to high school where all the kids knew each other. It was a small town and everybody knew each other. And I was the only person there that was not known. I was like this weird kid that came in and um, 
And it's actually funny. I remember a story from grade nine. Everybody's in class and the, the English teacher is like, who knows what an onomatopoeia is? And nobody raised their hand. And I was like, I do, you know, and I'm like this shy little homeschool kid. And I homeschool. told them what it was. And everybody was like, what? <laughs> like, where did this girl come from? How does she like, they just thought I was so smart. And one of the girls asked me, where, where'd you go to school? And I said, I was homeschooled. Well, then they were all like, I was like an alien to them. Right. So it was actually kind of in that moment that I was like, okay, whoa, I don't want to be this, this weird kid, you know? And um, so then you just kind of, you start to try to navigate your way and, you know, you get in, you fall in with some kids that aren't so great, you know, and all these things start happening. And then you're put into all these situations where as a Catholic, you should say, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to, but I just felt like I wasn't strong enough. I cared too much what the other kids thought about me. And it was almost like I was embarrassed um, to be Catholic. Um, and I, I was embarrassed to be different or to have to say, no, I'm not going to do those things. And so, so going into high school, then father, father Anaya was, so how long was father Anaya there? Maybe I should ask you that first. Um, at the church, he was there. I, you know what? I honestly, I don't know the exact years. It was longer than a year. He mm -hmm. just taught us for that, that one year. Okay. Your um, eighth grade year. My eighth grade year. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, and he, he was so great. Like he wanted it to be like this little school and, you know, we had uniforms and everything was so great and it was so spiritually beneficial and we did do all the subjects, but like the religion was the main focus and I learned so much and um, it was probably at, in my childhood, the most Catholic I ever felt where it wasn't just like, you know, being Catholic is just going to church on Sunday. And, you know, it was, we were really, really good Catholic kids and he did a lot for us. And it's almost like, you know, I do, I regret going to high school because <laughs> I feel like I came off this like amazing Catholic spiritual year. And then I just went into high school and it was like everything that I learned, everything that I, that I had built up was just wiped away, you know? So. And was that something that was, was that, a slow progressive thing. I and mean, like you said, like even one action, one, you know, one word in high school can, can change or set you on a path that, that, that sets you off a path, I suppose. I mean, was that something that was pretty slow or pretty quick? Um, I would say it happened really fast. And I feel like when I think about it, I feel like, you know, high school was a place where I, the devil knew that he could get me. Like, you know what I mean? Like he knew, he knew exactly what buttons to push, exactly what my weaknesses. And, and this is where I feel like as Catholics, if we know that these, these situations and these um, places are dangerous places to go, we shouldn't go there. But, you know, I was young and I, I didn't want to listen and I wanted to go. And my mom, she didn't want us to go to high school. Like even when my brother, I have a brother who's a year older than me. When it was his turn to go, he fought her so hard and he wanted to go. And she was like, no, I don't want you going there. Like they're bad places. And she said, well, you can go for half, half the day. Right. Because my mom was stuck in this very difficult situation because, you know, you have these kids that are, are pulling at you and they want to do these things. Like, what do you do? Do you, you know, like, yeah. do you, do you risk being like, it's just, it's a very hard spot for a parent to be in, I feel. And that's why I'm glad that I feel like some of these things are being taken away from me. <laughs> like, you know, the whole, the school system here in Canada seems to be going down, but anyways, so, and then, so grade nine and grade 10, grade 11, 12, and things just progressively got worse. And the more I fell away and the more I, I did away with all the spiritual stuff and the more I made my life secular it just it's like a it was like a slope that was just going down and down and down and then you keep going so far you can't seem to pull yourself back to the the kid that you used to be and i do remember times in high school thinking to myself like what what are, what have you done you know like why are you 
like you're not the girl that used to go. My grandfather, my grandparents used to take us to Omaha every summer. They would drop us off with the nuns in Omaha and we would spend a week with the nuns. And, and I used to go there and I used to feed the chickens and I used to spend all this time with the nuns. And I thought it was the most magical place on earth. Like I thought the convent was the best place to be. Like when you think about, oh, most kids want to go to Disney World for vacation, right? You know, I wanted to go be with the nuns. That's as a kid, that's where I wanted to be. So I would think to myself, what has happened to you? Like, you know, you're, you're not this kid that used to want to just spend the summer with the nuns, you know? So you then kind of get so destroyed, I guess I'm going to say the word I'm going to use, that you've completely lost who you were. And then if you're, if you're missing the spiritual, if the spiritualness is completely gone and you're just going to church on Sunday and you're just in a way fulfilling your Sunday obligation and that's the end of it, the grace is completely gone. All the graces are gone and, and it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. Um, and then after high school, um, I had a moment where I did... I did kind of leave all my secular friends behind and I did come back to the church and I made the church my whole life. And I actually, you know, had found a nice Catholic guy and I was even going to get married and do all this stuff. And then I just got sucked. You go, I went to one party, I went to one party and I fell in with friends that I went to high school with. And I just got sucked right back into that whole world again. All it took was one party. So, so, so real quick though, how, how did you get back into the faith? How did you get good again after high school? What, what was the impetus for that? I went to Colorado, first? I went to, Colorado to see Father. Well, then that, that would do it for anybody. I mean, that, that is yeah. the holiest state of all. I mean, that, that's an absolute uh, yeah. fact. And Father Anayo would I, agree with I, me. I'm absolutely sure. I loved Colorado. I see when he left our parish, um, the bishop moved him to Colorado and he was the pastor there. And then he invited us down. He was like all the, my sis, siblings and then the other family from the church. He said, come down and see me in Colorado. And I just loved it there. I fell in love with Colorado. Actually, it was a beautiful place. And, and uh, I was going to move there, but anyways, <laughs> <laughs> I should have moved there, but no, I am where I am. Um, but yeah, so seeing Father and I again, he he was a very um, spiritually beneficial pr uh, priest to me, a uh, very big part of my life. And he kind of pulled me back. Um, and I was only there for a week. And um, but he was a very good spiritual director. And um, and then I was like, yeah, you know, I got to get back to my roots. I got to get back to being a Catholic. I have to take this seriously. Um but then, like I said, one party, I came home and one party and I, I got so pulled in by these people, um, these friends of mine from high school. And they just, they knew, they knew exactly what buttons to push to play on my insecurities. And um, that was, I think that was a big part of it was my insecurities. Um, I had a lot. Um, so they played and, on and why, those. why why is that is that because of your temperament you think or what what's the reason for the insecurities um you know what i don't i don't really know if it's my I, it probably is my temperament but um you know i had my my dad like i mentioned um was not catholic so there was always this element in our life that where the the call catholicism um ended with my dad mm. you know like you were always kind of walking this thin line around him because you didn't want to upset him. You didn't want to, you know, but you know, I love my dad. Um, my dad is deceased now, but, um, and I always wished that he would have converted, but, um, you know, it's just, it was just hard growing up in a family where there's, sure. there's uh, Catholic and then there's not even just, um, not Catholic, like the complete opposite, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I had a lot of insecurities from that. And I also had a lot of um, insecurities um, with just trying to, like I said, in high school, just trying to fit in and always trying to be cool, I guess is the word. Um, I never wanted to, to look 
uncool or like a dweeb or whatever. So when I went to this party and I had re-met these um, friends from high school again, it was like all of a sudden, all those feelings came rushing back. And it was like, I don't want to look like a nerd. I don't want to look like a dweeb. And I was actually even set to move to Colorado. I was going to move. Mm -hmm. wow. And um, the power that these people, I mean, I know I'm my own person. I know I control myself, but the power that they had to even like, they were just like, you're moving to Colorado. What? Like who does that? You know? And I was like, well, well, uh, no, well, I don't know, you know? And then you mm -hmm. start, so, and then they were like, well, just come out, just come out with us one more time, one more time. We'll go out and we'll, we'll have fun. And then one more time turned into three more times mm -hmm. and then five more, you know, and then it just, it just, again, spot downward spiral. And I was just sucked right back in to this secular life. And the world has such a pull on you. Like it is so dangerous to even flirt with the world. Like it is. It is so dangerous. You cannot um, walk that line where you're going to be somewhat worldly and somewhat Catholic. Like, and I realized you, you have to be a Catholic. You cannot be both, you know, and um, Father Saunders, who is our parish priest now, he gave a really good sermon about having your feet in the right boat. And you cannot have your, you cannot have your feet in the Catholic boat and the worldly boat. Because they're going to be sailing along and they're going to go like this, you know, and what happens when you have your feet in two boats, you're either going to fall in one boat or the other, or you're going to fall in, you know? So I, I feel like I was doing this dance where I had my feet in two different boats and the pull for this boat was just a little bit too strong. I was too weak and I wasn't spiritually um, strong enough to be in the right boat. And, and so before we move on to your, to your, I guess your middle life, your, your later life, I, I, what, what would be your advice for anyone listening who is in high school or for perhaps just before high school or just after high school? I mean, what would you tell them? What would you tell them now that you've gone through it and you've been through this? I mean, not everyone can, can homeschool or go to Catholic school. And so some people have to go to public school or, or that's, that's where they are. As, as you said, you, you are where you are sometimes. So what would be your advice if they're there i mean i'm sure you'd probably say just homeschool right but if they have to be oh. there, what would you say well these high schools they are scary places i will tell you that um i mean for parents if you have to have your kids in those schools the the home life has to be 100 percent catholic all the time you have to give them that really rich, spiritual, rich Catholic home life where, you know, the minute they walk in that door from school, you, you have to provide them with a home that, you know, they're going to be walking into pure, utter uh, Catholicism all the time. You know, it has to, the spiritualness has to be there. The spiritual reading, the prayer, the prayer life has to be there. Um, and those, cause those were things that I didn't have. Um, and I mean, it's, I'm not blaming my mom in any way, but she had to work, you know? So when we got home from high school, she wasn't here and, um, it's just the way our life went. And sometimes you just can't help things. Um, you can't control everything, but, um, you know, I, I did have all the fundamentals, all the spiritual fundamentals to have a good Catholic life and be a good Catholic. Cause when you think of a teenager, you know, you are, you're older, your mom's not going to, you know, wake you up every day and say, say your morning prayers. Like that's on you as a teenager, you should be, you know, on your way enough that, you know, you have to get up and you have to say your morning prayers. But my prayer life was zero. It was zilch. It just went from here to here in, in a matter of instance. So well, and, and I would think too, I mean, one of the things that I always think, and I think you mentioned before that it's, you felt like you needed to be the cool person, you know, that, that you didn't want to be uncool. And I, I remember feeling the same. I was homeschooled and then I went to Omaha, but but I played baseball in, in a public high school and I got a little bit of the, the flavor of what it's like. And then a little bit of that pressure of people asking you, okay, you know, hey, oh, you can't go to the game on Sunday. You know, why? Uh, you know, yeah, <laughs> I'm going to church, you know, and, and I, I remember feeling kind of ashamed of it, which is a shame, you know, and I did have two very, very devout Catholic parents all the time. And it's still hard, 
But I think that's that's what you got to try to teach these kids, you know, these these teenagers, is that we have the coolest thing on earth, and and, it, and it's 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 the truth, and it's but it's the most beautiful, most incredible thing. Start reading the lives of the saints and, and the talk about the coolest people to have ever lived. I mean, just it's an incredible thing we have, the incredible history. The Catholic Church has written the history of the last two thousand years. So I mean, it's just I, I think that that's that's something that I try to get across is that. It isn't uncool, and the world and the devil desperately tries to make you think that it is, and that it's just a thing to be embarrassed about and ashamed of. And oh, someone's walking by, hide your rosary. And it's like, what? What are you talking about? I mean, the rosary is this is is this weapon that we've had for hundreds of years, and and it is, I it is it's so cool. And and I think that that's that's something that I just want to tell any any teenager listening that don't ever feel that way. You've got the truth. Everyone else is wrong. That they're wrong, and and they. Will be miserable for it on in this life and, and probably in the next. And well, and the other thing that you mentioned about the rosary it reminded me too in high school, you know, the fashions, um, the push to be cool and the fashions. When I went to high school, um, they weren't modest. All right. So, you know, like wearing a scapular, I even like, you know, I did things like I took my scapular off because, you know, how could you wear a tank top with a scapular? It would look stupid, you know, but I shouldn't have been wearing a tank top. Like I should have been like, okay, if I have to cover my scapular, I have to wear a shirt that comes up to here, you know? So it was even just little things like that being embarrassed of my faith. And it's like, you know, well, how can you expect to keep your faith if you're embarrassed of it? Right. You know, like you're not, you are not going to keep your faith. And, you know, I know, I know a lot of, um, not a lot. I know someone from our church that went to high school and she should have been the most shining example for me. She is none now. And, you know, she went to high school and she didn't care. She didn't care what anyone thought of her. She was like, I am here to just do my duty, do my schoolwork and go home. And, you know, and it showed because, you know, now she's a nun and she, and, um, you know, so she definitely had the personality to go in and still keep her faith and do this. So, you know, in a way, when I hear those things, I was like, you were just weak. Like you were weak. I mean, at the end of the day, you can only blame yourself. You can't blame other people. And you were not strong enough. You did not um, take your faith seriously enough. So and that's on me. You know, so but anyways, I um so then, you know, I'm coming into my years as I'm an adult and I had moments where I would teeter back and forth, like, okay, you know, I'm back in, in the church as the center of my life. And then, like I mentioned, you go to a party and then that all falls away. Um, but then, you know, I, um, my, my father committed suicide. So that was very hard for me. Um, and that played a big role. That played a very big role because then I, I started taking comforts in people and things that um, like I was looking for, you know, that comfort. So I should have leaned on my faith and my religion and I should have leaned on God. But instead, I went a more worldly way, um, a more secular way. And I I did go after my dad had passed. I did went and seen uh, a psychiatrist. And that was a mistake. That was a huge okay. mistake because, you know, I should have, you know, I should have went to a priest or something, but I, like I said, I took the more secular viewpoint and they just mess with your heads. I feel, I mean, I'm not downplaying psychiatrists. I'm sure there are some out there that are good, but, um, it was more of a very narcissistic approach. You know, they, they took it in a more narcissistic way, which, um, I, I didn't need that. Narcissism was not my problem. <laughs> like I was, well, I had enough narcissism to go around, <laughs> you know, so that didn't help. So it's just little, li little mistakes like that, that I did that just kept pulling me further and further away. And, um, and then I met, um, my husband who now my husband and he was secular of no faith of anything. And, um, from there, I just moved in with him, broke a lot of rules. Um, and then that was like, that was like hitting the iceberg and the ship going down. And 
I did um, my daughter, I had my daughter outside of marriage. And then that caused a giant um, riff in my family. So my family, basically, um, I knew the rules. I mean, we're all Catholic, we know the rules. And my mom said, you know, you can't, you can't do this. And then I was kind of like, well, what are you, you know, what are you going to do? You're going to not talk to me. You're going to not. And then I started becoming very, um, like, I felt like everybody was against me. Like I was, I was the black sheep and everybody was against me. And I, I just went to this place that was like, well, you're not going to tell me what to do. I'm not going to, you know, if I, if you're not going to accept me for who I am. And then you, you have all these people. So I had, you know, my husband's family and I had, friends, secular friends telling me they can't tell you that they can't, they can't treat you that way. You're allowed to do these things. So you have all these people in your ear and then you start to be like, you know, yeah, you can't, my family doesn't love me. They don't love me if they're not going to accept this, you know? Um, so then I was, I was still going to church. I was pregnant. I was still going to church. And I remember um, at the time, Father James was our priest and he came over to talk to me and he said, you know, Holly, you can't, you can't do this, you know? And I was like, well, why? You know, and it was, it was so stupid because I knew the rules, but what I wanted was I wanted my family to tell me that what I was doing was okay. And they were not going to do that as Catholics. They were not going to do that. So then what happens if you're not going to tell me what I'm doing is okay, I'm going to leave. And then I left and I was like, I'm not going to church. I am not, I will never step foot in that church again. If you are going to um, tell me that this, that if you're not going to accept what I'm doing, I wanted them to accept the sin. And my mom's like, we are not going to do that. We are not going to do that. And deep down, I knew, like, I always knew like, this is like, I can't, I can't ask them to accept that, but I don't. Honestly, I don't know really what I wanted. And I feel like a fool. Like, I feel like I was such a fool for even trying to go down that road. Um, so then I, I, was I was away from the church for five years. So I had my daughter um, and then my husband, who wasn't my husband at the time, we're now married. We Since when I came back to the church, um, we got married in the church and everything like that. But um, I spent five years away from the church, not talking to my family, not talking to anyone um, and just going on very worldly. And I lost every bit of myself. I lost every Catholic thing about myself. And I was completely worldly, completely secular. And, you know, I had my um, in-laws who were, almost like they kind of egged it on, you know, like they were kind of like, yeah, your family can't tell you that you don't need them. We'll, we'll be your family. We'll love you. We'll take care of you. You don't need all that. It's a cult. It's this, you don't need it. So then you just keep going deeper and deeper and deeper down this rabbit hole. And then you're like, you're not even the same person. Like I had no idea who I was. I wasn't a Catholic. I wasn't of any faith. I wasn't, I, honestly, I don't even, I always believed in God, but I worked up this vision of God in my, um, in my mind that he actually accepted what I did. That I was like, you know, God loves me no matter what. And they're all wrong. You know, and you have all these people telling you that, that this is a cult and this is wrong. And you start to believe it because sin makes you stupid. Sin makes you so stupid. And when I look back on it and I think of the things that I said about my faith and about God, I, I cry sometimes thinking about what I did um, because it was bad. Like the things I said about the church and the things I said about my family, they were really bad. Um, but I was literally in this just disgusting pit of sin and it just was multiplying. Um and were you, were you generally unhappy or, or how did you feel at the time? I guess even worldly at the, wise. At the time, I thought I was the happiest. Like I thought mm -hmm. I was the happiest ever. And I thought I got this all figured out. I know everything. They know nothing. And they're going to regret 
you know, they're going to regret treating me this way. But when I look back and when I actually think about those five years, I was not happy. Like there, there was no happiness there. I mean, I had my daughter and yes, my daughter was, you know, happiness, but on the surface, well, my life was miserable. Like it was miserable. And, um, you know, I had, there were no good times. Like everything, when I look back, everything that we did as a family, you know, with my husband's family, or um, I did have relatives I spoke to on my dad's side, um, everything that we did, it was just filled with sin. And it, they were not good, happy, genuine times. It was just, I don't even know how to explain it. It was like, you know, the scene when they're in the Ten Commandments, when they're dancing around the golden calf, <laughs> you know, it's just music and drinking, you know, and it was just, that's not happiness. That's not joyfulness. That's not, you know, and at the time I was like, you know, we're, we got this all figured out. We're good. We know what we're doing. We're having the best time over here. We're not. And, you know, I missed things like I missed my sister, my youngest sister. When I was away, my youngest sister got married. I missed that. I wasn't part of her wedding. My other sister got married and I did go just to the the um, church part, the actual marriage, but not the reception. But it was like a really quick because she called me and she was like, please come to my wedding. Just please come to my wedding. And I was like, yeah, sure, I'll go. But I'm not talking to anybody. I'm not doing anything. So we went in. I watched and then I left. Um, but, you know, I missed all these things. And those are times that, you know, I will I will never get back. And I mean, I'm not dwelling in the past because we're as Catholics, we're not supposed to do that. But it is sad to think about that, you know, because of all this sin and all this stuff, I thought I was living this good life. And my whole family, who I thought was over here crying because I was gone, they were just living their good Catholic life. You know, they were just going on and I missed it all, you know, because I was just stupid and I allowed myself to go get completely pulled away. And so what, uh, what led to you coming back then, I guess, from that, that pit, I mean, that, that hold it's a, which, I mean, I, it makes sense. I mean, as you said, I mean, it, it, it piles on top of itself if it's, if it's pride or if it's, anger or envy or, or whatever, you know, one of these, these major sins, it's, it just builds on itself. And especially if you don't have the sacraments or the sacrament of penance to be able to, to get that, you know, forgiveness of your sins and to start fresh. I mean, I can only imagine, I mean, I, I was for even just a couple of months without the sacraments. I was in New Zealand for a couple of months and that for someone who's born and raised in the Catholicism, it really starts to wear on you after a while. I'm like, Oh man, you know, I, I didn't feel right. It felt really unnatural. So I can only imagine for five years, it must have really weighed on your soul. So, so I'm curious, I mean, how, how did, how'd you come back? I mean, how did, how did the, the, the prodigal daughter, as I said before the show, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but I mean, how, how did that, how did the story work out? How did you come back? Well, at the time um, when I was coming back, I didn't know that, well, I mean, obviously God is always at play here and God always has a way of doing things. And there was a lot of things going on behind the scenes that I didn't find out until much later on after I'd already come back. So um, it was kind of, it was really weird. And it was just kind of like this surreal moment where I was driving long. And at the time, um, my mom owned a flower shop, um, which she didn't own when I left. But I had heard through people that, you know, oh, your mom has a flower shop now. And I was like, oh, OK. So I'm driving along and I'm like, you know, I think I should go see my mom. And I bet you, you know, if I just walked into her flower shop, maybe things will be fine. And, you know, I was having these feelings of like, you know, I really miss my family. I started to really miss my family. And at this point, I had my daughter and I had now had a son. So I had two kids that um, my family had doesn't didn't know. Um, and then I was like, no, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't go see her, you know. And then I was like, well, maybe I'll call up my grandmother. Maybe I'll call up my grandmother. So I called up my grandma and I said, you know, I really miss you. I'd like to go out for dinner or breakfast or whatever. Can you and grandpa meet me at this restaurant? So I met my grandma and grandpa at this restaurant and we had um, breakfast and and it was fine and everything. And they they were very like they didn't push. They didn't pry. They just acted like nothing happened. 
They didn't bring up religion at all or anything like that because, you know, that would have been a sensitive subject. So that was fine. And then after that, I went to my grandmother's house once. And I, I called her up. I said, I want to come to your house, but no one's going to be there, right? Like, I didn't want to really see anybody. And she was like, yeah, no, just be me. So that was fine. And then I was like driving around again. I'm like, okay, today's the day. I'm just going to walk into my mom's flower shop and I'm just going to see what happens. It's been five years. I can't take this anymore. And I just really missed my family. And at this point, I didn't want, I still didn't want anything to do with the Catholic church. Like I, like when I say I left the religion, I really left the religion. Like I was like, I am never going back in that church. They, you know, shunned me, blah, 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 which in reality they didn't. That was me. I did that on my own. Um, but in my mind, I was like, they shunned me. So I'm like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to go into the flower shop. And I didn't know what to expect because when I left, my mother was really mad like really mad. Her and I had like screaming matches and, you know, it was not, it was not pleasant. So, um, and I mean, that's on me because of what I did to her, but anyways, so I walk into the door of this flower shop and it was, it was a big, long, long store. Like it was like the front door was here. And then she was way, way, way at the other end, down at this end of this long hallway. And it was really sunny. And I remember her telling me that she looked up and she was like, Oh, someone came in, but she didn't know it was me. And then she kind of started to walk slowly closer. And she was like, is that Holly? And then she just came over and she just hugged me. And if anybody knows our family, we're not huggers. Like we're not. <laughs> so that was weird. But she hugged me and she was like, and I was like, you know, what? honestly, in my life, that was like one of the best memories. It was like, it was like coming home. It was like everything that built up in those last five years in one hug was like, I felt undone. Like it was like, you know, you're back. We're just glad you're here. Let's move on, you know? And she didn't, um, she didn't press. She didn't pry. She didn't, you know, do anything. And I, I got there at probably about noon at her flower shop and I stayed all day and I talked to her and I worked with her and the kids were there and she was meeting the kids. And then she's like, well, let's go out for dinner. You know, it's been too long. We'll go out for dinner. And so we went out for dinner and everything was fine. And I thought, you know, that was like a bandaid. I just ripped it off and everything was fine. And then I slowly started integrating back into my family. You know, I talked to my sisters and, and, everything like that. And my cousins and that, and it was about a year. Well, uh, yeah, it was one year that I had come back to my family, but I still wasn't going to church. I still was not ready to actually walk through the door of that church. Um, and I remember my mom would drop little hints, you know, like she, like she wouldn't push, but she'd be like, Oh, they're having an all saints day party at the church. You should bring the kids. They would really like that. You know, just always letting me know that, you know, they want me back there. Um, but like they didn't, it was like, I was like a scared little kitten, you know, they didn't want to push too hard because they were afraid that I would go like, Oh no, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. You know? And, and, and what think, was keeping you out of the church? I think shame. I, I was very ashamed of myself and I was very, um, what it was a small church. So, like when I say small, I mean, very small, you know? So I, I just, I couldn't get over that hump of walking through that door and seeing all these people. And I know you don't go to church for the people in the pews, but when you go to a small church, it's like, I'm so, I was so ashamed of myself. Like I was so like, you are such an idiot. Like, you know, and I put way too much emphasis into what people thought about me. And I just, I really wasn't, ready to deal with the things that I had said and done. And it wasn't so much the things that I had done. It was what I had said, you know, like I fully said to everyone around me when I was gone, that that church was a cult. I was the one that really had the hatred. Like I allowed that hatred to take over because I wasn't getting my own way. Um, so I just was like, I just wasn't ready. Like I just couldn't bring myself to go in there and go into the church. Um, 
But then I had kind of a moment where I believe that God was like, listen, you're going to get your faith back or you're going to completely lose it. So, um, and you know, you, you have to just move on here. And it, it was honestly, I'm so grateful to God because it was a push and it was a scary push, but it was like, this is scary and you got, you need to come back. So, um, after a year I'd come back and I was, everything was fine with my family. We were all getting along and I was at, um, the shop with my mother and all of a sudden my daughter started having these massive breathing problems and she couldn't breathe. And, um, I think she was five, five or six at the time. And my kids were not baptized because remember I was away from the church when I had them. So she's, she's having these breathing problems and she's struggling to breathe. And it was almost like she was choking. And I look at my mom and I'm like, what's going on with her? And my mom looked at me, she's like, you better take her to the hospital, like right away. You, but you have to get in the car and you have to go. There's something seriously wrong with her. And then I got in the car and then, you know, as you get in the car and, and the kids are strapped in, you're just driving along and the drive from the hospital was about 25, 30 minutes. And all of a sudden this thought came over me that she could die and she's not baptized. And that hit me like a ton of bricks. It was like a giant weight pressing on my chest that I really screwed up here. Like I've really screwed up. And now if this child dies and she's not baptized, like, what am I going to do? You know? So I, I started praying Hail Marys the whole way to the hospital. And I hadn't said a Hail Mary in, well, not what now would have been six years. I had not said a single prayer to God. And I was like praying the whole way to the hospital. I said, please, Mary, please do not let her die. Please do not let her die. I have to get her to the hospital. So I got her to the hospital. Everything was fine. She had like some pneumonia or something. But um, that Sunday, I was in church. And I was like, you know, that was what I needed. That was the push that I needed. And um, I didn't tell my mom that I was going to church. I didn't tell anybody. It was Father's Day. Oh, actually, no, I did tell my sister. I called her up and I said, what do you think mom would do if I walked into church? I did ask her that. She goes, oh, just do it, Holly. You have to come back. And um, so I, I was Father's Day and I just walked into church. And my the look on my mom's face was just like every single prayer in her life had been answered by seeing me there. And it was it was a moment I'll never forget. And it was I'm going to like it was miraculous for us. Like I'm not saying it was a miracle, but it was miraculous for us. You know that it was a feeling that I will never, ever forget. And, um, I had found out afterwards the, while I was away, my mom had read the glories of Mary and she did all this sacrificing for me that I didn't know about. She did all this sacrificing, all this prayer and all this, this really hard work to bring me back. So I do owe a lot of my return to my mother because she, she gave everything she had when I was gone. She gave everything I had to bring me back. Like she did all this sacrificing and, um, you know, but I mean, that's what her mother's for, you know, but, um, well, and I think one of the really interesting things that I think we had a conversation a couple of weeks ago with you, you and your mom that you could, you kind of told me a brief version of the story. And I think one of the things that really struck me was that she said that while she was do doing that, she was doing the, the suffering and the prayer and, that she was also not ready to accept your return yeah. as, as you know, so if you had walked in the door, what, two years after that you had left, she may have just, you know, smacked you in the face or something. Right. And I think that's, yeah. that's an pretty incredible thing that we don't, we don't really think of it that way, that, that the prayers and the sacrifices and the timing, it worked on both sides. I walked in there and she hugged you. And that was a grace, not just for you, but also for her. And that, that's a pretty, yeah. that's a pretty incredible thought. I mean, like, I'm not, I'm not saint or anything, and I'm not saying this to sound pompous or whatever, but we, I feel like we, we both kind of fixed each other, you know, like I, I mean, if I could go back and do it differently, I would never leave the faith knowing what I know now, but I feel like, you know, these things happen. God allows these things to happen. He gave us all free will. And, you know, I do feel that, um, it has made me appreciate my faith um, way more than than I would have maybe if I would have 
have stayed. I mean, we don't know, but um, I do have this deep, deep love for my faith now that I didn't even have um, even when I was a kid, you know, that I really value it and I really cherish it. And I even so far as to think, you know, how blessed am I that my grandfather found um, Our Lady of Victory? You know, like what a blessing and what a grace from God. Like what did my grandfather do so, so well that God blessed him in that way? You know, because how blessed are we that we are chosen? We are Catholics and we are chosen and we are in the, in the fit, the true Catholic faith, you know, and I, and I took all that for granted. And so when you take something for granted, you know, you lose it. And, um, yeah, so. No, it's, it's, it's really, really well said. And I think that you, you see how God works in mysterious ways and, and the people he puts in your lives, some of them for the worse and some for the choice to, to make the right decision or the wrong ones. But I think you know, Father and I is another good one who I, I think, I think just, just because I, I love Father and I, I, I think I should attach his email address to this podcast just so he's going to get, he's going to get a flood of people trying to, 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 to talk to him about the spiritual Father guidance. And, <laughs> and because I, I like giving Father a hard time, um, I, I think I may just do that anyway. But, uh, but it, it's, it's great whether or not he, he also, with my young, one of my younger brothers, my younger brother must have been eighth grade or so, and he, he was a pain and really, kind of a rebel and really not a path, but not on a good path and, and really kind of an idiot. And yep, you went up, my parents moved to Olathe with father and I and cleared them up in, I'd, I'd say a year. It was really a year. And I remember I, I was in Omaha at the time. And I, I remember I came home for a summer and I was just like, what happened to Dominic? He, he's, he's not a little turd all the time. You know, he's a kid. And my mom's like, oh yeah, father and I, I was like, okay, that's, that's great. No, I mean, it's, you, you see that, yeah, sometimes, yeah, these people that are put in our lives, they, they, they do, they do a lot of good. And I think the, the way God works is it's amazing. And, and it's, it's a, it's a beautiful story. And I, I truly appreciate you sharing it because there's a lot of really, really personal information there that, that I think that is not everyone would share that. And I appreciate that you do, because I think it's a, it's an extremely valuable story to show that anyone can fall away and anyone can come back. And I think that story is all about, right? Well, and the thing, you know, the thing that I learned is that, you know, God, God is not going anywhere. God will always be there. And even, you know, in those years that I had, that I wasn't Catholic, I completely turned my back on him. He was always there. And when I think back, I, I can remember little moments and little times that, you know, he was always looking out for me. He was always there, even though I didn't deserve it. And even though I was not worthy, um, you know, he waited, God waited and waited for me. And, and even though I said some very hurtful and very disgusting things about my religion, about my faith and about God, um, that, you know, he, he has forgiven me for those things from those things in the sacrament of confession, like what a beautiful faith we have that, you know, God, you know, if you are truly sorry, God does forgive you for the worst sins. You know, all you have to be is truly, truly sorry. And, um, you can come back from anything, you know, you, and at the time I was like, I felt so much shame and so much embarrassment and so much this, I wasn't, I was just thinking about how other people felt about me when I should have been thinking about what I did to God, you know, and it wasn't until that I truly um, understood and realized how I had hurt um, our Lord and savior that I could really come back, you know, like it wasn't, it wasn't until I stopped worrying about the shame and level on a, or the shame and embarrassment on a secular worldly level. And then I realized what I had done spiritually that i could come back well and I'm, I'm sure that the the reception or i think when you have that shame you, you expect people to look at you like you're still a sinner but if you stay obstinate, i'm sure with most people as christ does he, he welcomes us back it's not like and it's not looking at us like oh you've been gone for so long you what were you doing it's thank goodness now you're back with us that's been my experience 
others to come back. Unfortunately, there aren't there aren't a ton of stories, but but that's pretty neat too to try to maybe whoever if anyone's watching this who who is hasn't been to church and and it does have that shame and that fear. It's totally understandable. Of, of course it is. But the, the people, I think that's even another trick of the devil to trick you into thinking they're all going to be judging you and, and wondering why you're back. But I think it's it's really the opposite. They're just, I, I think, really. Yeah. And I mean, and that's the other thing, like those those thoughts. And like you said, they are they're tricks of the devil. And it's, you know, because he doesn't want you to come back. So he's going to do everything he can to keep you away. So he's going to play on what he knows will get you. You know, so if you're insecure or if you have problems with pride or if you have problems with this, you know, he's going to play on that. He's not going to play on things that you don't have problems with. You know, he's going to get you where it hurts the most. And he knew that about me. Like he knew that I had this insecurity and this that I cared so much what other people thought. So he he plays into that, you know. Right. Yeah. A valuable thing to remember. Right? The devil knows the game. And he's done this hundreds of of souls he knows how it works new and and so that's why we got to fight it and, and, and know ourselves no no try to really understand yourself and understand your weaknesses i mean the, the temperaments i think are, are a bit dangerous when you start looking at it for others but i think to try to understand yourself i think and i think there are i i i, I wish i could say i don't know maybe maybe i know several priests will probably watch this so please for the priests watching this please comment and tell us good um, Catholic um, self-understanding books, because I know they definitely exist. I just can't think of any off the top of my head. Really important. You guys can understand what is my main weakness. Where is the devil going to try to strike me? For everybody, all the time, he's going to get you no matter what it is. So the best way is to be prepared. And, and of course, as you mentioned before, the best way to battle that is, is prayer and the sacraments. Unquestionably. Yes, for sure. Yeah, if you can, uh, I really had to, um, uh, I feel like I have to really overdo the spiritual reading now, because I just, um, I really want to make sure that I keep that the center of my life. And I've found that the best way to do that is a lot of spiritual reading. Um, and it's really helped me. Um, well, and your podcast too, is actually really great. It's actually really helped me even in the last, um, when, when I found you, I think a month ago or two months now, maybe, um, all the episodes, it's, there's so much spiritual richness here. And I know I'm plugging your podcast, Kevin, because it's great. It. <laughs> if you don't do it, I've got to do it. Then it's just embarrassing. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, it's, it's awesome. And I feel like you're doing a lot of good for people. So I just wanted to say that because, um, it, it's, I found it very helpful for me. So. Awesome. I appreciate that. And I think, I guess with those, um, and it, I'll just, and, and any other nice things you want to say about the podcast, go ahead and do that now. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No, Holly, I seriously, I really appreciate it. I appreciate the content that you've created. It's really fantastic. I hope. And I, if, if you have any last words you want to give to those who fall in the way or to those who are falling away, perhaps, or any just. Um, well, I think that, um, the one thing I learned, and I did, I have had people actually, because, you know, when people know that you've fallen away and then they reach out to you like, oh, you know, this person is, is, I feel like they're falling away or they have fallen away. What should I say to them? What should I do? You know, honestly, the best thing that you can do, in my opinion, is prayer, prayer and sacrifice, because if they're not in a place where they're receptive to what you're saying, you're just wasting your breath. Like there, and honestly, I know that sounds very harsh to say, but if somebody has closed off, they're not listening and they're not, you know, and for, for me personally, it was a, it was selfishness. I didn't want to hear what anyone had to say, because in my mind, I thought I was right. So I wasn't hearing anything. So the best thing you can do is put all that, um, that focus and, um, that energy into prayer and sacrifice for that person. Really appreciate it, Holly. And anyone who enjoyed this podcast, this show, please like, share, and subscribe. Comment, do all those fun things. Um, yeah, we're always trying to create good content, have interesting interviews like this one, and we hope to continue to do so in the future. So please share it with your family and friends and, and your priests. And and I'm going to try. I want to try to get on Father Anaya. I want to. I want to. I want to yeah. find his email address right now. I'm going to send him an email and say, Father Anaya, please come on the podcast, and uh, maybe he can give us some spiritual advice 
here I in want the coming to weeks. I, I, no guarantees. I don't know if he's going to come on, guys. I haven't asked him yet. I but bet he but now that it's now that I've said it on 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 a podcast, it's going to pressure him a little bit. I hope. Yeah. So. <laughs> I'd love to have him on. And uh, either way, we got we got more fun stuff coming, more good stuff coming in the coming weeks. So please stay with us. Holly, thank you so much again for, for your story and God bless. Thanks, Kevin. Mm -hmm.